But good morning and welcome uh, to our new series called The Bottom Line. Um, we are in troubling times in this country and in this world. And things are changing rapidly, constantly changing. And uh, I, even in the last week, you know, if you've been watching the news, things have drastically changed in our country and even around the world. I, I saw yesterday uh, there are protests even going on around the world. Uh, so things are changing quickly, and um, we did not do this series with the most recent events in mind. But uh, we decided to do this a couple weeks ago, and, uh, and we, I just felt like that this is a time when I just don't want to let this opportunity go by without hearing what God has to say about what's going on in our own minds and hearts, because that's, that's where... The work really happens is in our own minds and in our own hearts, and so this is a, a serious series, and um, it's uh, it's just something that I felt like was necessary for us to talk about. It's called the bottom line. So each week we're going to take uh, going to take a, a question, and we're going to and we're going to look at it, and we're going to see what God's bottom line. What does God have to say about this certain subject. And this week, we were talking about the world in crisis. The world is in crisis. And what is the bottom line? If you look around and you're, you're nervous about things, you're uh, afraid, you have fear, anxiety about some of the things that are going on in the world, what should you know? And what is the bottom line? And the bottom line is that God is our refuge. God is our refuge. Now, if you have not been trusting God in your, your life, if you haven't been trusting Him for a while, when something new comes up and it's time for you to trust Him, it's hard to get into that mode of trusting God. Uh, for some of us who have trusted and depended on God for a long time, and it's very apparent in our lives that we're, you know, we're trusting Him, we, we need Him uh, for our next day and our next step. And uh, for those of us who are accustomed to trusting Him and trusting in Him, putting our faith in Him, it's not so hard to, for that to carry on into the next thing. But if you uh, have not, are not accustomed to that, I, I can tell you it's probably going to be difficult for you at first to put your faith and put your trust in God. The bottom line is God is our refuge. Let's look at this scripture. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. He is our refuge and he is our strength. An ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, because God is our refuge and strength and he is our ever-present help in trouble, therefore, because of this, we will not fear. We will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the thing that has always stood, the thing that is strong, the thing that is above us, the thing that, that we have put our trust and hope in, may, though those things may fall into the sea, we will not fear. Though its waters roar, and you can just imagine, a mountain falling into a sea. Anybody ever seen a mountain fall into a sea? I haven't seen a mountain fall into a sea, but I can imagine it creates a roar. The waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Can you imagine? This is, this is what the world is doing right now. Things that we thought we, thought we were at peace. We thought we were safe. Uh, but circumstances over the past couple of months have, have shown us that we're not as safe as we thought we were. We're, we're not as calm as we thought things were going to be. And the waters are roaring and foaming and there's lots of chaos and, and all of this going on in the world. It's an upheaval. The mountains quake with their surging. There is a river. Can you imagine that? So with all of the chaos and all of the, you know, the mountains falling into the sea and the, 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 the ocean's waters are roaring and raging and foaming, there is a river. 
All we see is this ocean. It's, it represents the world and all the chaos in the world. All we see is that. But did you know that there is a river? There is a river whose streams, I love this, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. What is a river? If you've ever been in the wilderness, you know that the river, a river in the wilderness is a highway. If you ever get lost in the woods and you can find a stream or a creek or a river, some of you that hike know what I'm talking about. And you can just follow that stream in the direction that it's flowing and eventually it will take you out. It will take you to a larger stream or a larger body of water. Eventually, it will take you out. Eventually, it will lead you to safety. It will lead you home. A river is a way. A river in the wilderness is a highway. A river in the wilderness is a way. And though the ocean may, the oceans may roar, there is a river. There is a path. There is a way. And this way, this way, this river, this river makes glad the city of God. Now, let's bring this into the New Covenant. Makes glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Now, do you know where that place is? Right here. There is a place in you that gets glad when you take the river. You get your eyes off of the waves and the, the tumultuous sea, and you take the river... There is a way that makes that part of you where God dwells, it makes him glad. It makes you glad. It changes things. God is our refuge. So if God is our refuge, then why so much fear? I mean, even among God's people, I, I see a whole lot of fear. A lot of fear. I had a friend this week that I was talking to. I uh, was talking to her, just carrying on a conversation, and I could see right away that she was very fearful of things. And she said, Rob, what's going to happen? She said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. She said, nothing like this has ever happened in the history of the world. And I said, you mean since the 60s? <clears throat> since the 60s? And she said, well, what happened in the 60s? See, she, this, she's too young for the 60s. She said, what happened in the 60s? I said, well, in the 60s, you had the Vietnam War. You had the Vietnam War protests. You had, uh, you had the civil rights movement. You had the assassinations. And imagine all of this taking place. The assassinations. Assassination of a president. Assassination of his brother. Assassination of our civil rights leader, Martin Luther King. I mean, all of this going on, and, and, there were, and there was much more than that going on in the 60s. And I began to tell her about that, and I said, you know, God brought us through that time, and, and he will bring us through this time, I believe. And she said, is it the end? I said, I don't think it's the end, but I said, who knows? Only the Father knows. I said, but you can trust in God. Why is there so much fear? Well... God's nature, if you haven't noticed, God's nature is that he speaks. If you read the scripture, in the very beginning, the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light. All of creation was formed when God said something. He, he speaks and things happen. And then in the New Testament, we see in the first chapter of John, in the beginning was the word. What is the word? The word is God speaking. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in the beginning, there was not anything made that was made without this Word that was in the beginning. And this Word was made flesh and dwelled among us. This is Jesus. He is... Some, God, God spoke Him into the world. You know what I mean? He spoke. It's, it's God communicating. It's, it's the Word made flesh. This is God's nature. He speaks. But there is another message that's going out in the world today, and the message is fear. You hear it. Almost everywhere you hear it. Fear, fear. 
The enemy wants us to be afraid. So let me just say, um, stop right here, and I want to say that there are some fears that are good fears to have. They're healthy fears. The fear of fire. Okay, that's a healthy one. The fear of fire might just keep you from getting burned to death. Okay? Let's be drastic. Okay? The fear of fire is a good thing. The fear of heights might keep you from falling to your death. There's a healthy fear there. The fear of this COVID virus, you may be one of those people that's at risk or may have a family member that's at risk. And, and this is a healthy fear for you to have. I know that if, if, I, if I bring this into my house, I'm going to compromise someone who is in my house. It's a healthy fear. The, uh, the other day, um, uh, I went with a friend to the emergency room. And uh, I had to take him because he was injured, and I, I took him. And I went with him to the emergency room. And I, before we got out of the truck, I said... Listen, I've got a couple of masks in the back. I said, let's, let's put those masks on. And so we wore the masks uh, during our long stay at the emergency room because there are no short stays at the emergency room. And we sat there with masks on for hours. And every person that I saw in the emergency room had a, had a mask on. Everybody that I saw at the hospital, every single one had a mask on. And so those those kinds of fears, I mean, those are, those, are, those are good things to know, you know? What, is, what should I be afraid of? What is wise for me to be afraid of? And then what is unwise for me to be afraid of? So, the enemy wants us to be in fear because he wants it to be an obstacle to what he uh, has envision for us to do in our lives. He wants it to be an obstacle. He wants fear to be an obstacle. He wants you to be afraid of everything. He wants you to be afraid of, uh, of the good things and the bad things. He just wants you, to, he wants you to be paralyzed. He wants to paralyze you with fear. People out of fear, they're asking all kinds of questions. What's going on in this world? It's like my friend. This has never happened before. What's going on in the world? Is this the end? Is this the end of the world? Several people have asked me, is this the end? Where is God in all of this? Where is God? Well, he is here. He is here. And the question that I think that we all ought to be asking, this is a good question. What does God want me to do? There are a lot of people out there that, that think they have the right questions and they think they have the right answers. If you don't believe me, just go on Facebook and you'll see. Uh, everybody has the answer on Facebook. It's real easy. And you can get as many answers as you want. You just read post after post after post. And a lot of these posts uh, have to do with what they think somebody else ought to do. You know, the, the answer is that somebody else should do such and such. That's the answer. There are not many people out there saying, I think the answer is that I need to do something about myself. I've seen a few of those, but I haven't seen many of those. I think it's time for me to do something about myself. What does God want from me? Well, I can tell you this, whatever it is that God wants from you during this crisis, you have the ability to do it because God is not only our refuge, God is our strength. God is our refuge and our strength. Remember our first scripture? God is our refuge and our strength. So when I was praying about this this week and I was saying, now Lord, there's so many things that you have told us in the scripture. What, out of all of the scriptures, what is it that you would want to say to us during this particular time, during this particular time of crisis? What is it that you would want to say to us? And I thought back to a passage in Isaiah that is one of my favorites, and I've, sh I've shared it here before, once before, uh, but it's okay to do a scripture twice, I think, in church, right? So I'm going to share this with you again. It's Isaiah 58, begins in 6, and it says, 
Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? Before this, he says, you know, you have, you have fasted by afflicting your soul. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen for you? To a day for a man to afflict his soul in sackcloth and ashes? He says, there's a better fast. Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? A better fast. To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke in your own mind. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke in your own heart. You know, I read this uh, study years ago. I, I tried to find it and I couldn't find it. But years ago, I read the study. It was a study they did with different people groups around the world. And, and what they found in common with all people groups is that if you, really, if you really ask them enough questions, you find out that every culture, every people group, every race, they think that they are superior to all other groups and races and cultures. It's just a cross the board. Not just one race or one culture, not just people that live in this country, but people that live, whether they live in a penthouse apartment in New York City or whether they live in the jungle, it's the same. We have biases. Did you know that? Now, there have been two or three, I just have to say this because I think it's hilarious, but there are two or three people that I've known in my life who have made the same statement. They have said, Exactly the same thing. You know, I am not prejudiced against anybody. In fact, I have to correct that. The only people that I'm prejudiced against are the people who are prejudiced. I've had several, several people to say that. And I want to say, well, aren't you better than all the rest of us? You have no prejudice at all except against the people who are like the rest of us, prejudiced against somebody or something or some culture or some, something that we have a bias against that's related to people. And what the scripture is saying is get rid of your biases. Get rid of this idea of being self-important, that you are better than others. Do not... Do not bind people up with your words and with your thoughts and your attitudes and the way you talk. And, and it says, loose the chains of injustice. Don't be unjust to anybody. Be just to everyone. Loose the chains of injustice. Untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. The scripture is telling us that God wants us to go from being an oppressor and you might say, well, I'm not an oppressor. Well, maybe you need to think about that. Maybe you are in some way, in some situation. Maybe you are an oppressor. Maybe you just think that way. Maybe you just think this certain people, this certain group of people is oppressed, and that's the way they are. They are bound, and that's the way they are. Fortunately for me, I have made better decisions in my life. Fortunately for me, I am you know, smarter, wiser, whatever the case may be. I'm getting into your Business, because this is what God is speaking to us during this time. It is, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? So you might say, well, you know, I, I, I give to the church or I, I, I'm in a group and we feed certain people. Uh, there, there may be other types of this. The, the poor wanderer may not be someone that doesn't have shelter. Maybe they just are aimless in their life. Maybe they need a cup of coffee and a conversation. Maybe they need a friendship. Maybe they need you in some way that you haven't thought of. When you see the naked, someone in need, clothe them and do not turn away from your own flesh and blood. This is important that we not turn away from... You know how important family is? Family is important. Your family, whatever role that you have in your family, if you're a father, they don't have another father. If you're a mother, they don't have another mother. If you're a brother and sister, maybe they have some others, but they need you. 
You know, whatever role you have in your family is important. Don't turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light. Then your light. Some, some of us are saying, I'm praying, but God is not answering me. Well, maybe your heart is just not turned toward him yet. Maybe you want him on your own terms. But if you let the oppressed go free and you get rid of those, those bonds in your own life, in your own heart, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Who does it appear to? It appears to everybody. What happened to him? He was, he was this way and now he's that way. Okay? That's what God does with us. I remember when I first became a Christian, I had people pointing at me all the time saying, what happened to you? What happened to you? You don't talk the same way. You don't act the same way. You don't laugh at the same jokes. You don't, you don't say the same things. You don't do the same things anymore. You're always talking about Jesus. What has happened to you? Your light, my light broke through finally. My light broke through. Your light will break through will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. He will watch your back. You don't even have to watch your own back. God will watch your back for you. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. And he's always been there. He's always here. He says, and you will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with a pointing finger. How many of us have the pointing finger? Anybody accusing anybody? Anybody out there accusing anybody? Maybe, maybe you need to stop doing that. Stop pointing the finger and stop the malicious talk. Listen. When I'm telling you these things this morning, I'm not telling you these things because I don't have these same problems in my own life. These are the things that God is speaking to me all the time. I, you know, I never used to come down governors. For 15 years I lived here in Huntsville and I never came this way. Ever. Ever. I went to the parkway. I said, I'm not going, I'm not going down there. I'm going, I'm going to the parkway and I'm going to 565. I'm going around to go to 565. But since we started the church, we've been here for over two years, and I come down this road all the time now. And I I promise you this, I have to, when I come down this road and I see the homeless on the side of the road, I see somebody that doesn't look like me, I see somebody who hasn't made the same decisions that I have made in life, someone who didn't have the things that I had the opportunity to have. I see that person, and God has to remind me on a very regular basis, almost daily, that he loves that person as much as he loves me, that he cares for that person. He has purpose for that person as much as he has for me. He adores that person as much as he adores me, and I have to be reminded by the Holy Spirit Don't be thinking too highly of yourself, Rob Hall, Mr. Jesus Man, Pastor. This person that you're looking at and saying, oh my gosh, what's happened to that person that caused them to be the way they are? That person is just important to me as you are. So let's put away the pointing finger and malicious talk. If you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. You know what that's saying? It's saying that the darkness that is in you, the darkness that is in you will disappear. That's what happens when light comes. The darkness disappears. It vanishes in the presence of light. The Lord, your The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Can you imagine? What is a sun-scorched land? It's a desert, a sun-scorched land. 
and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden. That's an oasis in the middle of the desert, if you haven't noticed. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. People around you, if you put away, listen, I know people who are much better at this than me. And, and when, when, when people see other people who have put away the malicious talk and have put away the accusatory finger, when they see someone like that, it is like an oasis in the middle of the desert. And people gravitate to that kind of person. They do. And, 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 you, and people will notice that you are like a well-watered garden. You are a spring whose waters never fail. They'll look at you and they'll say, I need what they have. I need that kind of life in me. I need that kind of water. I need that kind of sustenance, something that will sustain me through anything. That's what I need. I need waters that will never fail. Your people, he changes it here. He's not talking about you anymore. He's talking about your people. Who are your people? These are your people. These are your people. The church is your people. He says, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. If we will individually take care of our own hearts with God, we will become part of the people. And our people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. I love this because most people don't have any idea what this is talking about. You will be called repairer of broken walls. Restore of streets with dwellings. Um, I had this argu argument with uh, some Christian friends of mine several years ago. And they were saying, the culture war in the United States is over. And we lost. Christianity lost. The culture war is over. When I turn on the television uh, and I go to certain podcasts that I really enjoy listening to and watching on YouTube because of the information and because of the guests and because it's so interesting. I'm, and then the lewd uh, talk and, 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 and just, just the immorality starts, starts becoming a part of the conversation. And it just, I just, I have to turn it off and I say, why? Why does it have to be that way? I look at the television shows and I, I, I look even back at some of the I, recently, I've been watching Seinfeld. It's an old show that we used to watch whenever in, back in the 90s. I guess it was the 90s. Uh, and I watched that show, and I think, man, I didn't realize how crude the show was whenever I was watching it. But, but when, you watch the, when you watch television, you watch the news, and when you, when you watch uh, podcasts on YouTube, you realize, man, this world seems like it's going to hell in a handbasket, you know? And people look at that and they think, well, the war, is o the war is lost, the war is over. There was once a sense of morality in this country, but now there is no more sense of morality. People say whatever, they, whatever uh, immoral thing that comes into their mind, they say it, they laugh about it, you know, and, and it's over. What I say to that is I don't believe the church has yet begun to fight this battle. I, not, not, not really, not really. I think that I think that the res restoration of the walls built on the foundation of Christ, I think that that is in our future. I think that's what's coming. I don't think that's what has been in the past. No, we are going to repair the breach. We're going to repair the broken walls. We're going to restore the streets with dwellings. You know what that is? That's a safe place. That's a, a fortified city where there are places to dwell on the street, dwellings, homes on the street that are safe for the children to go out and play. It's a beautiful thing. Lene says I say that all the time. She says, you say, I always say it's a beautiful thing. Well, when you talk about Jesus, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. All right, so the last thing I want to leave you with is don't confuse politics with faith. There's a lot of politics out there right now. A lot of politics. And, you know, you're not supposed to talk about religion and politics. So since I'm already talking about religion, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about politics. Is that okay? 
Let me say about politics. I have brothers and sisters, and you do too, brothers and sisters who are Republicans and Democrats and independents and moderates and whatever else out there. We have brothers and sisters that are both liberal and conservative in their leanings and in their uh, position on certain issues. And I am, I wouldn't say that I'm a Republican. I, 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 I'm almost as upset with the Republicans and the Democrats equally in Washington. And, and so I wouldn't label myself as a Republican, but I would say that I'm conservative. conservative. Anybody ask me, you know, I'll just tell you the truth. I'm conservative in the way I think about certain issues. And I hope you won't hold that against me. But I, I'm just telling you, that's the way I feel. But if I'm laying in the ditch on the side of the road bleeding, I promise you I'm going to hope that one of my Democrat, liberal, Christian friends is coming down the road. Because they, I appreciate, and you know who you are, I appreciate my liberal Democrat friends because they have so much passion and they have so much compassion. And, and even though they view things differently than I do, they're probably not going to pick me up off the side of the road and te- give me a lecture about, you wouldn't have been in that situation if you had made a different decision. They're probably not going to judge me. They're just going to give me some love and some kindness. And so I just want to say, I appreciate people on both sides. And we can be brothers and sisters in Christ and have different views on things. Somebody ought to say amen about that. I'm telling you, we can be different in our views, in our perspective, and love each other for crying out loud. There's too much hatred in the world. And the thing that I have against politics is there's hatred in politics. I don't want to be a part of politics because of the hatred that is in politics. I could never be a politician because there's just too much hate. Can't we have some love in this country? The thing that I want to tell you about this statement, don't confuse politics with your faith, is don't let activism or support for a particular viewpoint or support for a particular party, don't let that be a substitute for the activism that needs to take a place, take a place, uh, take take place in your own heart. I became Italian there for just a second. Take a place in your own heart. Don't confuse politics with faith. Don't confuse politics with faith. Listen. You, I'm not saying don't, don't be an activist. I'm not saying don't support whoever you feel to support or whatever cause you feel like you should support. I'm just saying don't let that take the place of what God wants to do in your own heart. He wants to clean this up, y'all. He wants to clean it up. And I'm going to leave it there. <laughs>